as a matter of degree. Since childhood, toddler babyhood, all the way to kindergarten and throughout grade school, and go to college, university, and go to a higher education or career or life. We are the creatures that we learn, continue to learn, we grow, we learn all the time. That's what makes us who we are. And if you look back in society, history, whether technology or society as a whole, concept, idea, religion, politics, everything. People and culture and country and nation and individual become better, successful, stronger, more powerful, more wealth, wealthier, healthier, live longer because of knowledge. Because of knowledge. And people coin it knowledge is power and knowledge is money and all of that. It's all true. We are creatures that learn, continue to learn forever. In this concept, I would like to break down into two simple points, in which I believe is important for all of us, especially for early stage of learning. There's two ways to do, two systems to do in more developed country, more advanced society, they learn a better way and more primitive and more less developed and less, um, yeah, less developed society and country still hold on to the primitive and I would say this bad way to learn, but still better than not learning. But these are the two. One, you can learn things because you try to mimic or memorize or try to remember the lesson or the example or the, the incident. That's fine, it's good. Memorization is a good thing. I wish I had the discipline to do that more when I was growing up, even now. It's a good part, play a big role in our life, in learning aspect and everything else. But memorization and try to remember or mimic or understand that and, and hold on to that example or individual story or lesson is not as superior as the other type of learning. Of course, we have to use crayon and picture and cartoon and so on. As Christ was teaching, he was using a lot of illustration and story. But he and all the teachers in the world, Christ, the best teacher, did not intend to teach story and say a story. And he always say, have you not learned? Have you not understood? Because a higher learning is not learning and memorization and memorizing the story. So even it's looking for the principle, the pattern, the pattern in each story, each lesson, each illustration. So <clears throat> whether you are in kindergarten or preschool, you look for the pattern of shape, color, or something that you can group it together. And you can group it, you can see the pattern, and ultimately you can apply to everything else. You see that? We don't learn shape and color for the sake of remember triangle, circle, and rectangle, and, and this and that, and that's it. No, we learn all of that so we can build blocks, build something, and put things together. And later on, even apply to 
philosophical concept more than physical concept as well. Such as triangle has the strongest force because of the angle and so goes to, and, and, and line and, this and that. And we apply into mental, psychological, and even we go and understand the spiritual world. First time we learn about number, we, we know that number is a number, zero, one, two, three, and then later on, we say, oh, before zero, there's a negative one. Oh, and then we study, oh, there was a line, infinity, to the left and to the right. It's kind of cool, kind of nice. And we learn how to apply that concept into major, bigger, and better, and stronger math, and that math is no longer just math. It becomes concepts that apply in finance, because in, and, 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 and in application, in engineering, and so on. So oh, no longer just that. People used to say, oh, what's the use to, uh, to study algebra? <clears throat> oh yeah. A universe built by God, yes, power of God and all that, but God in using his miracle, his power, create a universe and sustain the universe is all of that if you were to translate put on mathematical miraculous sunglasses I mean glasses you see number all over the place God calculate everything by numbers I'm not a mathematician I'm not promoting mathematician or mathematic but I do recognize everything that you know that you do that you live in and about using math he said, you're not good in math. Oh, yes, you do. You are good in math. If you're not good in math, you would have bummed into things. Now, some of you may be not good in math, bummed into things. But those of you, I notice that bummed into things all the time because you cannot calculate math, physics, and distance, and depth, and so on. But you're good in math and doing some other things. So I don't know. Maybe it's some missing part in it. But hopefully one day you are completely full every way. And we will because we are missing here and there and everybody missing something and have something as the grace of God gives us accordingly. My point is, we learn, we grow, <clears throat> it's a good thing, but we don't learn in a primitive way, just try to memorize only the story, only that particular lesson. We look for pattern. We look for system. We look for application that can apply to other things in life. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, starting from basic and move forward to a little bit higher in intermediate and advanced and professional and experts and become scholar in that educational world. Spiritual world is the same thing. Basic baby talk. And then you move up to memorization, understand this and understand that story. And then you look into not only the context, you look into the insightful of the depth of the context of what you're learning. And then you apply. And then you teach. And then you lead. That's the whole set of what God intends for us to do. And <clears throat> to apply all of that into our, what apply us in our church today, this day, this month, this year, 2018, it's phenomenal, it's amazing, incredible plan of God in theological, common sense, mathematical, scientific sense, everything perfect. The only problem is we, I personally, don't have enough storage or memory or capacity to receive all the information because my chip is very small. So I resolved my heart to take whatever I can, use up the maximum of the ability God gave to me, and proclaim it, preach it, teach it to you. Hope to see the church grow and move forward until the second coming, until he returns. So this is our whole goal. 
That is why we commit as a church, rightly so, in our mind, spirit, and pray and request to God that we want to make sure enrich the theological doctrines in our church in a solid doctrine and teaching that we all, starting from the leader all the way down to church member and young children, to know the healthy doctrine. The Bible talk about doctrine. The Bible talk about doctrine, healthy doctrine, not healthy doctrine. Truths and false, real and fake, good and bad. So, doctrine is important to God. Doctrine is important to Jesus. Doctrine is important to the apostles. Doctrine is important to the church. And we have the audacity to say doctrine divides. Oh, I hate doctrines. I just worship. What are you talking about? Are you Christian or what? But this is the result. The people who wrong view of doctrine result from poor and bad and evil and poisonous doctrine. That is why. Because people running around pollute doctrine using fake, poisonous, deadly doctrine since the beginning, since the beginning of the universe, beginning of the creation, I mean, <clears throat> all the way to the time of Christ and all the way to our present time. And for us not to worry about doctrine based on emotion, based on fantasy, using the Bible as a stepping stone to fulfill our emotion and fantasy and, I don't know, thing that is in the South A false religion. Even we use the name of Christ. Even we use the name of the Bible. So many cults come out from the concept, the circle of Christianity and the Bible. And that's really hard to detect and hard to deal with because they use the same name, the same cross, the same Christ, and the same Bible. <clears throat> we had the privilege and the blessing to learn doctrine. Last year we went through major doctrine. This year we continue to complete our major doctrine, three more points. We learned the very all important, but the first one, because we use the Bible, we learned, we studied the doctrine. A Bible, theological doctrine, the first point is the Bible, the Holy Scripture, and two, obviously we study the doctrine of God, which split into subpoint, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then we study the doctrine of human, who human, what we are really in the true teaching of the Bible, not people talking about people. This is talk about what God talk about, the view and the teaching from God about us. So the Bible, God, people, and then sin, and obviously salvation, we study those. And now we have three more to cover, church angelic being, both holy angel and fallen angel, meaning the angel that stay true and faithful to God and the angel that betray God become, became demons, follow the top ring leader by the name of Lucifer, now Satan, the devil. So we will study the doctrine of angelic beings after the study of the topic of the church angelic being, and the last one is the doctrine of eschatology means the final stage of human history, 
or the second coming of Jesus Christ, or the eternal stage. After that, eternal. No more. So three more major points we're going to study. I believe it will take us a year to do that. However, however long to take us, I'm not worried about that too much. I'm worried about how we, A, thoroughly understand the, those major, major doctrines in our church, in our life as a Christian, in our church as a Christian church, that's most important. Okay, important that we study, we learn. We understand clearly what we believe. And that has a significant result how we live our life. If we understand, if we are sincere and honest people, I'm not talking about hypocritical, uh, I'm talking about traitor or betrayer or someone who um, have a reason to be in a church of God, in a Christian world, it's a circle for different reasons. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about straight, honest, sincere Christian people. So we are Christian. We are in a church of God. We ought to understand what we believe. A. B. We ought to apply what we believe to ourselves. Three, it is very important related to the church, related to Christianity, related to our faith. We are to be, at, by now, the Bible says we no longer, we should no longer be in kindergarten. Basic, we should be teachers. We should be teacher, evangelist, or at least able to evangelize to people personally. We need that. So the church function is to bring us to A, have relationship, fellowship with God, B, to grow in knowledge so that, yeah, to grow in knowledge so we can have a relationship with God, to grow in knowledge so we can have a relationship with one another as Christian, and to grow in knowledge so that we can proclaim the gospel. That is a function of the church. Therefore, we're going to cover the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of discipleship, the doctrine of evangelism. Church have discipleship and evangelism. Very simple. A church is a place that we grow among ourselves. In a church, we send people out. Without that, it's not a church. It's not a church. So this is what we're going to cover. And also, I would like, I would always like to review what we learned just because 2017, 2018, they're not separated. In reality, it's not at all. We don't want to put a number in it. But the real breathing, oxygen, light, flow, the same. Just another day. Hate to say that. People make a big deal out of it, but it's not a day. Well, then, since we in the culture and, and human being that make a big deal of the day change, the season change, the month change, the year change, especially birthday, if we make a big deal of it, let's make a big deal out of it. I take what is given and turn it to be something useful. Now that is important to us that we are one year older, growing more, become advanced. How much have we learned? How much have we done? We like birthday party. We like receiving honor and glory and praise and so on. Do we deserve that? Do we deserve that? What we learn as Christian in 2017, what we done as Christian in our walk of life in 2017. Now look back and and examine and analyze our life, our breath, our action, our knowledge. Are we satisfied? Are we happy? Could be yeah, I'm happy then what do we want from that? We want 
to grow more or we're gonna stay? If we're gonna stay is defeat what who we are, the nature of growing. If we're not satisfied, if we're not happy with how we spend our breath, how many thousand times, million breath in 365 days in 2017, and we want to go back to relive that, that is really, really a defeated creature. Sad and sorrow, pathetic. People who are advanced in whatever the area or whatever the interest in those people, life, whether athletic, music, art, finance, whatever it is, I'm just covering a few. We better learn from the past, pick up the best, build on it, learn from the past, see the negative, see the poisonous, see the, the bad, and destroy it and walk away from it. That is very simple. Simple. And in conclusion today, I'm going to simplify for you as well. But we're going to go into the detail in a moment. Last year we learned all of that, and I would like to review only a little part of last year, cannot go over the whole thing, which is the story and the doctrine and the lesson of the birth of Christ. We saw that. And in the birth of Christ, we also said that we would like to continue the birth of, birth of Christ and the birth of the church together, which we were blessed and successfully done so last week. And now today, we continue the same pattern, the same flow, the same direction, but concentrate on more on the birth of the church. Not moving away, but take everything and translate and move forward with a new and forward direction. It's not to disconnect the birth of Christ, always, but build further, more in the birth of the church instead. We split into three simple miraculous events in the universe, in the human history, the birth of the universe. The birth of Christ and the birth of the church we saw last week. I was blessed to have received that personally and to have preached and proclaimed to the church. Beautiful layout, not highlight itself here, no, no, no. It is, was given to me by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, and many giant scholars that walked thousands of years before me. I'm just a little servant of God carrying that along. I was blessed by that. And we saw that God, a powerful, miraculously, and sovereignly, and almighty to create all those three. We saw that. Number two, we saw God, though he was powerful, almighty, he was the person or individual never, never have a shortcut on anything. However, he faced obstacle instead. Is that ironic? Someone who is so rich, so powerful, and deal with little things to take care of, small stuff, and intricately fix, and you know, um, trying to make it work. Instead of, i oh, just throw it away. I, I said, I'm powerful, said I'm rich, I build a new one. That's not in God's character. Though he's powerful, he is conservative. So he's bright and glorious, he deals with lowly and humble and dark and deep and sorrowful. He's joyful, and he deals with the one who's sorrowful. That's amazing, three concepts we saw last week. We cannot afford to go back to read each other. If you would like, please review on your own. But in those three events, major events in a human history and God's timeline on uh, understanding, of course, is span further left and future right to eternity. We will understand that later when we get to that point. But now we do learn something regarding <coughs> the character of our divine triune God. 
Yes, we learn about the doctrine of the church, the miraculous birth of the church. Yet, in learning this, we see God continuously, who he is, his character, his way, the way of God, his operation. And also, we see the implication, the application of all of that from the doctrine of the church, which highlight the doctrine of God, the triune God. Again, cannot split that. While we learn about God already, we learn about the Trinity, we don't need, no. Cannot split that. Because it's intricately woven, mixed permanently together, nothing split. There's no divine, no divided, no cut off, no broken line, everything together. Beautifully. So, we're going to learn deeper in not only history and a little bit of his character, we're going to go deeper than just action, but nature of God. See that? Last week we saw his power and his action, his nature here and there, but now deeper in how and when and what and how and what he did when he created the universe. When he created the body, the human person for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born for the birth of Christ. And when he created the birth of the church and we're going to study his characters, his intention, his heart, his personality a lot deeper in this three event as well. We learned last week. Now, going to this week, the birth of the church relate to all of that. We're going to look back a little bit to understand what the church, what our church, what the current, what the nature, and what the future of the church is by looking back to the birth of Christ, the birth of the universe. Now, focus and study this carefully because it's us now, in our present time, in our hand, in our responsibility, and are carrying to the future. Before, yes, it helped us in this, but it's in the past. Both in the past, this is present. Learning all those three, we see the same character, that God is a God who is very personal. Very personal. When he created the universe, when he created the heaven and the earth, when he created the blue planet, when, when he created the earth and the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, he was very personal. <clears throat> very personal. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, as we see that God is very personal. He's very personal. He's very friendly. He's very friendly. He's very communicative. 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 He is a person who likes to communicate. He likes to talk. He likes to communicate. He likes to listen. He still does that. Don't get me wrong, not just then. Three major events, the creation week, the birth of Christ, the birth of the church. God still does the same, but different method. The reason he is, has different method, because we, the one who fell, mess up. And God does different method to protect us from being destroyed, condemned. So he finds a way to carry his way, but still protecting us, called extended grace. Now, as we see this, three, the first part in a creation week, after the creation week, God created everything, and God has a pattern, God has a way. He come to fellowship with his people, Adam and Eve. And if you look at it closely, the Lord God came from heaven, walked in the garden. In the cool of the day, in the cool of the day, talking about recreation, relax. Cool, not talk about temperature necessarily, because temperature back then was relatively nice all day long, all year long. The word cool of the day talk about the relaxation, the fellowship the break time. God came to fellowship with them in the garden. 
He's friendly. Not only friendly, he is a person who would like to communicate, talk, listen, converse, and look. People run away. People run away from God, people run away from light because they did something wrong. And you and I know that the moment people hide, run away, being secretive, lock the door, tossing under the bed, hide, you know that something is evil. Most of the time. Most of the time you say, oh, the reason I locked the door and I put it is because I want to make sure it's perfect so I can surprise, bring this gift to you. Yeah, sometimes you do that too. But I'm talking about, generally speaking, they run away from God because they betray God, because they sinned against him, because they did not want to repent. They want to fix it on their own, oh yes. They want to quietly try to fix it. And they hide. They hid from God. The presence of God. And it's beautiful. This is talk about loving, kind, friendly, and positive. God still tries to commute, communicate with them, converse with them. Give them room to repent. God say, where are you? I didn't see you. God know exactly where they are, what happened, and everything. But God continues to give them a chance. A lot of time in our life, when we done something wrong, when somebody cut cut us, and then and they gave us a chance to repent, to uh, to admit, to say sorry, and to we once we don't take it, we get deeper, worse and worse, and that is hopeless. They were hopeless. And you know the story. God had to change his plan. From that point on, no longer directly the friendship, the relationship, the closeness with people because they cannot handle him anymore. They became trapped and cursed. And they cannot even bear the presence of God anymore because it's going to burn them because the sin, the evil, the deadness grow in them which cannot handle the glory of God any longer. It's not God to want to kick them out. It's they themselves set themselves up to get kicked out. Friendship, fellowship, the same thing. No family, no friendship, no uh, community or no society that just love and want everybody to be happy, to be together, and all of a sudden kick us out. No, no, nobody do that. Church never kick anybody out. People, the one who get themselves kicked out because they have something against the church, against God, against society, against the friend, against the friend and the family. Parents never kick children out from the house from the family ship, from the family relationship. It's the children when they grow to the level of betrayal and sin and evil and attack. The principle of unity, love, family, parents and children, children and parents, and they betray that and they look at what outside is greater than the relationship they have and then betray their own family. Look at people who are so dark, so evil, so angry, so hiding, so crazy, all of a sudden, no longer innocent and sweet and, and beautiful and bright and light and happy. Why? Because they have an agenda. It's not by accident, it's premeditation. They planned it all day long, all year long, now to reap the clear position of the clear separation and war in the relationship, whatever relationship is, whether family or friend or spouse or church or nation or human and God. There's no human ever grow up 
declare evil with God until they become older and they, their sin becomes stronger. That's what happened. But God still reaching out to them and say, where are you? It is so, so sad to see people hiding. So amazing how God so loving. God didn't have to come down. God created the heaven and the earth and the universe and the God and then people and just said everything and said, forget you, you just take care of your soul, take care of each other, whatever it is, the Lord of the fly, you grow up, you kill each other, it's not my problem. He could have done that, but he no, he came. He involved, he cares. You know, now we jump to, I know, big jump, to the second events in history, the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ, the time of Christ, Jesus was born as a human, perfect one, and grew up to represent the Father, and he himself not only speak for himself as Jesus Christ, the teacher, the rabbi, the second person in the Trinity, he also speak for God. God continued to speak to people through Jesus. Did you see that? So, we learned something. We saw that God is a person who continued to communicate, converse with his creature. And therefore, so for, um, so is Jesus. So was Jesus. Jesus was a person who the same as a father. He came down to communicate, converse, and teach people like the father. They have this relationship, this personality, relationship, friendship, teachership, and so on, rabbis, and so on. And at the same time, the Father and Jesus never split. The Father never stopped talking to people. The Father continued to reach out to people through Jesus now. At first, the first part, God talked to people face to face. And then people caused a lot of problems, create barrier between them and God. God spoke to them through the fathers and the prophets, by the prophets, to our forefathers, the Abrahams and, and all those people, patriarch. And then later on through the prophets, and later on, he spoke to us through his own son. You see that? This showed that A, God continues to speak to us, B, the Father and the Son are in one accord in terms of talking and caring and teaching people. So, now we focus our eyes from the Father to Jesus. But every time I talk about Jesus speaking to us, teaching us, we remember Hebrew that Jesus is not doing alone. Jesus is doing that with God. So, at this point, when I, meant, when I say Jesus, spoke or teach or care or like, it's not just him alone, it's the Father and Jesus, both of them together. But we're going to just, for the sake of conversation and preaching and talking and time here, just say Jesus. Our Lord Jesus have the same pattern, the same character, the same habit in loving and caring and teaching and speaking and communicating. And then again, footnote again, every time you see people cannot talk, something wrong, something happened. You can listen. So-and-so cannot talk anymore. Why is that? A, the person could have been dead. Yeah, people in a coffin, you know, grave cannot talk because they're dead, obvious. Or the person could have been sick or sleeping or guilty or something secretive that they're not happy to talk about or they're scared to talk about. So something could be wrong and not all 99% I'm talking about, this is the concept of sinful nature. But they're all things that you hold up, you don't talk because you want to treasure it, you want to keep it surprise for pleasant, for glorious reason. Yes, I agree there are something like that, but I'm talking about generally speaking when people cannot talk, cannot openly, cannot smile, cannot associate or communicate anymore. There's something evil about them or something wrong to them. Some evil happening to them or some evil they create. One of the other, something is negative. So you know that. But interestingly, those people who have problem talking to the family or parents or friends and all, and no more talking, it's all 
Cambodian would say Mau, you know, frowning and so attitude and so on. But immediately, the moment you let that person free with the group, with the outside, it's all of them just glorious, like glorious, like hallelujah in their own language and own world. That is, that show there's not the ability or strength or knowledge to communicate. It's the will of a heart. It's the nature of a person. Watch out. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, continue to be God, to be the Son of God, to represent the Father himself. As we see that, the very first record that record the first sermon, the first public action of our Lord Jesus Christ when he came out to the public in rabbi in teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, 2, and 3. We see clearly this is a main Matthew 5, 1. Clearly, his main concern and action and purpose is the death. Seeing the crowd, seeing the crowd come to him, he situates himself. You know, he went up to the mountain and sat down and decided, this talk about situate himself to take care of something. What did he plan? He planned, now that I have people around me, my nature and my mission is I'm a God, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who come to bless, to save people, and, and, and do in which way he opened his mouth. He's a teacher, he's a speaker, he's an announcer, he's a proclaimer, he's a communicator. He opened his mouth and he taught. He spoke to them, he taught them, he guide them, he leads them right away. You and I don't have all the gift to open our mouth to, to teach, to lead, to not all the same. But let me tell you something. We do have rightfully so in our own right, in our own gift. Because you and I know that we may not be able to come and sit down or stand in the public or in, a, in an official um, podium or pulpit. But we do talk, we do leave, we do talk to our friend. Just check your text message. Just check your Facebook. You talk even <laughs> to the point that you really need to talk about this. You talk. Because we are created in a in a nature to communicate. We are different from people, or from, not people, from animal, we communicate. Animal don't communicate. They have certain signs and this and certain that, chirping, you know, but we are the people who, in a higher intellect and ability and intelligence to communicate because we were created in God's image. And that's part of it. Snake don't talk. Only one did. But anyway, Jesus opened his mouth and taught, and in that opened his mouth and taught, what's the context? He blessed him. The same as the Father when he created the universe, when he created Adam and Eve, when he created everything, he blessed them, and Jesus blessed them as well. In Mark 10, 1, we saw that when the crowd came to him, he, as his custom, Look at that. As Jesus cursed them, he taught them. We talk about entertainment. We talk about, oh, feeding the need. Oh, we just make them happy. We give them food. We give them entertainment. We give them this and that as long as they can. But Jesus said, the principle, the main focus of God in the church and all of us as Christians is to teach people. We are to be the mouthpiece, the word, Jesus, the word of God. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, talk about in the beginning there was Jesus, Logos, or the word. And the word was with God. Now you see two individuals. 
not just a concept word, just Greek philosopher say that a word is just a concept. No, this is a real person. This real person was with God. How do I know the real person? Because the real person was God. So we talk about two individuals together and they're both God. That means they're both one entity. But the, this one God have two person in that separately, clearly. And the world don't understand. We don't. We just accept that. A lot of things in the world, in math book, in science, in finance, in many things we don't understand either. But why are we so uptight about it? Because we resist the authority of the word of God. God is one God, but clearly two persons. And that two person, one main thing represents Jesus from the beginning. He is the word, he's the mouthpiece, he's a communicator, he's a teacher, he's the word of God. He was God with God with the beginning. That's why Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is a preacher. Jesus is an evangelist. And everyone follow him will have this trait, this nature, a different degree, what not, but do have the same nature. Now, we move forward. We say, oh, we see Jesus, we see the Father clearly. Oh, you say triune, you say you're Christian, people have believe in three God and one God. And where's the Holy Spirit? We talk about Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't worry, we go into it right now. When Jesus leave the earth before he left in John 14, he told that I'm going to go away, but I will ask the Father, I, Jesus, ask the Father, the Father, two individuals, give you another helper, another individual, another like me, come to take care of you, to help you. Helper here is not the helper, or we think a helper in the classroom is teacher aid, or helper in a, in a workplace as a secretary, or making coffee and making copy and so No, this is not the helper we're talking about. This helper is the person who will help you and me to attain, to accomplish what no one can do, only God himself can do. This is the person who help you and me to stay out of hell. Only God can do that. And this helper will be with you forever. No one can be with you forever unless that person is divine. To do this, to care for you forever, the person have to be Amazing individual, cannot die. He is the spirit of the true. I say, what? The spirit of the true is not the, the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the true is the same as the Holy Spirit. True means holy. True means perfect. He is the spirit of holy and perfect. He is the spirit of God. He is the Holy Spirit. He will be with you. He will dwell with you. And he will be in you. Again, only God can do all of this. He's a comforter, he's a helper, he's a, he's a protector. Help us protect us. Verse 26, now the cloth here to explain the helper clearly, the helper, comma, the Holy Spirit. Now, it's even clear. His name is the Holy Spirit. Whom the Father sent him in my name, Holy Spirit, sent by the Father in the name of Jesus, will have the authority to teach you all things, all things. No rabbi, no teacher have the authority to teach us anything, all thing, anything, let alone all things, unless he is supreme authority. Supreme authority, ultimate, supreme God, supreme teacher. He is the one who can teach us all things. And the spirit of truth, spirit of holy, the spirit of God, from God and in the name of Jesus. He will teach you all things, all things, and he will bring your remembrance, your memory, everything I taught you. He will remind you everything I teach you and more. Can you see the ring? If Jesus has the authority, the power to ask the Father to send him to you, means Jesus is an amazing individual in the Trinity. 
Now the Holy Spirit come in and to teach you everything Jesus taught you and all things above and beyond that Jesus didn't get a chance to teach or whatever, but the Holy Spirit will fill all that. That means he is amazing, very powerful individual. Now Jesus can go in peace. And he said, 27 to 28, peace be with you. I'm going away, but I will come to you. Verse 28. And this talk about the first coming and the second coming. Jesus go away from us, but he will not leave us often. He will come back to pick us up, to take us home. However, Jesus never left. Though he left, but he have his other him, the Holy Spirit, but it's not Jesus. This is the third person in the Trinity. Represent God, represent him to be with us forever. So Jesus in that sense never left. But he did leave and he come back. This is the conflict of the Trinity and the conflict of the doctrine of the Church of God. In the book of Acts, final state, which is the birth of the church now. After three days buried in the tomb, Jesus rose from the dead and he represented, he presented himself alive 40 days to his disciple. He said, I'm alive, but I'm going to show you and teach you everything about you, what you need to know. But the Holy Spirit will bring everything to completion for me, to you. Because this is a promise from the Father, which I already told you, that you will be immersed completely in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will be completely with you, in you. Individually, in the whole church. This is where the church, where the birth of the church, where the representative of Jesus Christ, where the representative of the Word of God and God took place on earth. Permanently now. Before, when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the whole, whole globe, beautiful, perfect globe, we mess up. Not that God cannot do it. God knew that. That's why God has planned three plans. And when God sent Jesus Christ to come down for us to love, to worship, to fellowship, and we mess up. We kill him. However, God took that moment... Let all this run its course, but turn it to be something positive and beneficial. He allowed this to happen so he can purchase, clean, clean it from our sin, pay us back, not pay us back, pay our sin and take us back to himself because we mess up in the creation. Now, Jesus accomplished. Thirdly, Jesus enrich and that the last program he gave the birth not the world not the birth of Christ but the birth of the church in which and where we now save forever because we in the save entity the body of Jesus Christ himself and the body of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit govern completely saturate individually and corporately as a church of God where we no longer mess up. By God's power from beginning and plan to redemption plan all the way to conclusion in the church. It is not by accident. God didn't say, oh, plan B. No, no, no. There's always one plan. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will be here. Verse 8. Not only the Holy Spirit will be here with you, guide you, and teach you, but you also receive the power, the divine strength from God, from the Holy Spirit, who bless you, teach you, and guide you, and walk with you to accomplish the mission for God. See, this is something that God designed to make a greater blessing. For us, for our sake, but to bring him glory. You and I now 
Not that we're greater than apostle and prophet. No, no, no. But the extent of a mission is greater. The extent of mission is greater because now we become the witness, witnesses of God, of Jesus. Before they mess up, represent God as a king, as the person who in charge on the earth. You should have dominion over the nature, of it, but you, you represent me. I make you in my image, they mess up. And nothing close to God, the weather was so perfect. Jesus Christ time came and so on. The apostle have all of that, but they limit it. That's all. They were powerful and amazing, but stop there. But the teaching of the apostle, the creed, the doctrine of faith, now forevermore until the end of the human history. It's in our hand, it's in the church, who we are in. Look at this, we have so much privilege. And the path only limited. Talk about us, 2018, we were so limited. But 2017, I'm putting play on this New Year type of thing. But the concept is you and I understand our privilege, our power, and our future. You will be the witness of me, Jesus said to move forward. And it's no greater than that, to have that privilege. But the character, characteristic of those people God called, if you want to know, who then? How do I know? The principle in here in verse 12, 13, 14, show that they are the one who immediately obey what God said, even though it look tough on them, look difficult, look strict, look not too happy. He said that, go and wait for me, crammed together in this upper room. They went, they went there and they did exactly what God said. And sure enough, Acts chapter 2, when the time came, when the day of Pentecost arrived, there came the Holy Spirit from heaven as planned. Ten days exactly, boom. And God, verse 4, and the Holy Spirit filled the room and everyone the, as a whole, an individual with such presence and power and gift. New era. Now, from this point on, they receive power from God. They receive miraculous power that they would go and preach and perform miracle. And that's the arrival and the gift of the Holy Spirit. How about us? About us, since that day on, the Holy Spirit continued to work. He changed his method in which he gave power to the Christian. Then the Christian the apostle have to be authenticated by the power of the Holy Spirit to show to them, to be born to them, who they are with miraculous power. And now everything complete. Some people believe that we still have this miraculous power. Uh, I don't know, but I have to confess, I don't have, I don't have any. Only thing I have is my faith, the grace of God to give me the faith and the transformation and trying to follow my um, the doctrine and conviction and the Bible. That's all I have. The powerful, the thing that I can claim the most, or not claim, can say the most, I have this, this privilege and power is pray to God and ask God to do the work. That's all I have. For me to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to speak in different language that someone can understand, I am without learning, I have to learn language like crazy. So, that's a different story. That's not the topic here. The topic here is we receive the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, we start to perform, accomplish mission. That we could not ever done otherwise. That's what I'm talking about. In witnessing, proclaiming God's name to the world. And number two, to bless people. 
And that is the power that we receive. Look at yourself. Now that you call yourself Christian, a believer, and growing in the church, and receive the power of the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit, is that anything, number one, converted. Number two, transformed. Number three, obviously, we were into a glorification state. I mean, we, number one, converted, become Christian. Number two, Transform sanctification, growing in Christ, in God, become powerful than who we were before. And thirdly, we all will reach glorification. God will glorify us. I know it sounds strange, but it's in the Bible. And crown us and bless us. No more of who we are. Right now we're stuck in this flesh. So those three things will be baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you say, how do I know? Simple. Not so much of speaking in miraculous tongue and this and that that people claim they have. I don't know. But according to the Bible, I see how Peter did. Verse 38, the power from the Holy Spirit that give to Peter, Peter preached mightily and directly to the audience. Two things, boil down to two points. One, repent, deal with your sin, people. Deal with your sin strongly against sin, Peter. Number two, commit to God. Deal with your sin, commit to God. Deal with your problem, commit to God. Fix your problem now. Repent and be baptized. Be baptized here, talk about it. Commit to the world, tell the world that you belong to Jesus. You belong to Christian. You walk away from the world. That's what it meant. Not just necessarily dung in the water. That is a physical form. But in the context, I'm telling the world that I no longer walk with the world. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I'm a Christian now. This is being baptized because you receive forgiveness of your sin and you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And look at 41 to 47, the result of that clear commitment, confrontation to the sin, and encourage people to grow. <clears throat> Commit to God, 3,000 souls was added to the church that day. And the result quickly, they devoted number one in the teaching of the word, number two, fellowship, taking care of each other, number three, breaking the bread, communion, remember Christ, number four, praise. Church must have those four elements. And 44 to 45, 46 now, you see that in human form, in the fellowship form, they take care of each other, need, help each other. All the needs that they may they have could be emotional, physical, financial, spiritual, whatever they help taking care of each other. And the result was 47. They all collectively, individually praise God together. And they live a life that not perfect, but no offense to people around. They lived a life that people look at Christianity and Christian Jesus say, yeah, I have some respect for these people. I like that. I don't mind at all. They join us or not, but I do mind when we offend God's name by making people disrespect God through us. We call ourselves Christian, but we live and we act and we proclaim, we Facebook ourselves as some other wise, something otherwise. But people look at them with respect. But they praise God. And then the result again, and the Lord added to their number day by day. Not anybody, please understand. Ultimately, God add to God's church. Those who are being saved. We are not looking for numbers, people. We're looking for people that God converted and added on to this church. And it's okay. I know we feel bad that people leave church and so on, the numbers. I know, humanly speaking, we feel a little bit struck. But do understand, God 
care for the number who are being saved. That's it. And so in our town, only two people getting saved, our church down to two, and that's exactly what God wants us to do. It's a good thing. God is purging. God is pushing out and God putting back in the one he saved only. Because the church of God, according to Colossians chapter 1, 18 to 20, is the church of God is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Was 20, it was 19, the church of God is the, a place, a location, a body of Christ of all the fullness of God in the world. So, you understand who we are, who our church, who we are, and who our church is. I mean, what our church is. And through that, as individuals, through that, as corporately, as a church, God reconciled the sinful world to himself. To himself. But again, he reminds us through the blood of his son, the cross. Again and again, remind us, it's not we are now Christian, we are now evangelists, we are now have the spirit of God, we are now have the gift, and we so, so arrogantly go out and say, oh, we can do, no, 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 no. People who so arrogant think that they can do things on their own because they have power from the Holy Spirit and the, that doctrine, forget that by the blood of his cross, by the power of Jesus, by the work of the Holy Spirit only. We are the instrument only. People forget that because they don't know the doctrine. And they claim their own way of powerful, miraculous, high-class Christian. First class Christian, you guys are second class. No, no, no. This is why Paul said, to Timothy in the Ephesians, uh, 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 Ephesians church in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 32, to be careful with wrong doctrine, be careful with evil from outside and inside, come together and create a new doctrine. Be careful, because they're going to come and destroy your church. But for you, the Holy Spirit, again, the Holy Spirit is the leader, the owner, and the, the superior in the church of God, appoint you to take care of the church of God. You be careful. Therefore, be careful, alert, watch out. In verse 32, all of this that I tell you to be careful, I tell you to be alert, and I remind you, verse 28, that the Holy Spirit, the one who generate and create and protect. And verse 32, and now I command you to God, instead, to God, to the Holy Spirit, you see, not you, not the church, though the church is important, but that church, even that church, with everything that I give you, you depend on Jesus, I mean, depend on the Holy Spirit and God. Two, not that he, we don't depend on Jesus, depend on Jesus, of course. And two, because the blood of Jesus paid for the church. I commend you to God and to the word, the word, the word of his grace. See. In conclusion, God the one who sustained, creates, sustain the church. God the one who sent the Holy Spirit to protect, to teach, to conclude. And all of this, he did this in all of this simple way to us understand is in the word of God. So you better do this. <clears throat> I give you to God, I give you to the church. I mean, good to the grace of God. Who, which is able to build the word of God is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of God, the church is a place that honor God, honor the Holy Spirit in the word of God, not supernatural, superstitious, our own doctrine, our own crazy, like or magic. Oh, this and that. I don't like that because it's not in the Bible. It is the place that Jesus shed his blood. That is why it's important for us to remember. He told Jesus to hunt Apostle Paul directly. And Apostle Paul put this as the decree. As the church ordinances, one, to be baptized, to proclaim to the world that I'm a Christian now, and no longer shame, no longer walk with you, my friend. And number two, Occasionally, it's depending on how your church setting, I will commit myself to remind myself you died for me. 
and commit to God, commit in my soul to God, and thankful and repentance that I'm sorry that I caused all of this. Therefore, I'm sorry and help me to go on pushing this out in front of my life until today. Number one. Number two, to remember to thank you enough for me to go out and proclaim your death until the end. This is the church of God. We proclaim, we continue to grow, we continue to repent, we continue to remember God, especially in the communion day. Paul said, ask, for I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, broke, took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you, take it, enjoy it. Do this in the remembrance of me. Such loving, giving, ongoing, reminding and teaching, however, he never failed to say there's some traitor in your camp. The same hand that take the communion is the same hand that kill me. Therefore, you all take the cup, take the bread, should examine yourself who you really are. It's grieving God and grieving us grieving me to see how we betray God in our small action. We may not flat out, overtly, directly spit in God's face, but we do think that we do not honor Him. Not directly, but indirectly dishonoring God and call ourselves Christians. And that is scary. And God said, do not do that because you commit yourself to follow me, to take communion, communion because this is the most memorable, most special moment to remind you of me dying for you. And you take it lightly, you going to get cursed. You can get sick, weak, and die. God can punish us on the spot for taking this lightly, he continued to teach us. However, those of you, all of us, who take this in verse 26, we proclaim the Lord's death. We become an evangelist in our life, in our action, in our word, in our teaching to one another, to other. Ask us up. We've been taking communion all this year long, and now the new year, have we proclaimed the Lord's death to people? Have we commit in our, whole, our, our soul as we take communion and make it simple for you? People who love God, who believe in God, will do follow the footstep of God. Simple as that. Remember I said, I'll make it simple. Which means, our God, our triune God, both Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in giving and loving, and teaching, forgiving, all of this to us, we will do, not miraculously, to the maximum power like God, we'll never be able to do that, but we do this. What God hate, we hate. What God love, we love. This is a simple way to examine who you are before you take communion, before you face the judge at the end of the day, at the end of your life, at the end of the human history. You will face God. How do you know simple examination? Do you love what God loves? Do you hate what God hates? The answer is yes, you are blessed. Now, I turn the table to show the character of a non-Christian, a fake one. If God hates something we love, if God loves something we hate, you know who you are. God hates something, you love that something. 
God loves something, you hate that something. Clearly, this person, this character, who claimed to be Christian, who claimed to take communion, who claimed to go to heaven, not going to heaven. Simple. Two groups. One, love what God loves, hate what God hates. Two, love what God hates, hate what God loves. Very simple. And this group, fake or not, eventually they'll come out from this shell and say, you know what, Mom, Dad, I no longer want to go to church. Because I love what God hates. I love darkness. I love sin, sinful people, and my group, my friends, is all sin, go to hell. I love them. Mom and Dad, I say goodbye to you, to the family, to the church, to God. And do not be surprised because that in that nature, that person all life long. You know it. You saw it. It's a matter of time. You see that? And on this side, people, not perfect, people make mistakes, people love God, hate, people hate what God loves, but repent and hate that, hate that action. Now sorry to God, come genuinely, truthfully, repent and God, I'm sorry, I love what you hate, and I hate what you love like these people, but I don't like that. I'm sorry, forgive me, and thank you for even allowing me to come to even say sorry, to even crawl to you, and I appreciate it, I thank you. Help me from this point on, until I'm free from this flesh, this person that have a lot of sin hanging on me. I desire that God. And that you judge yourself, you condemn your sin yourself before you take it, you will be, as Paul said, will not be condemned along with the world. Yeah, I'm going to 32 already. So, conclusion. God, though the way the system looks like change, but the same nature in everything he made. From creation to the birth of Christ to the birth of the church. Miraculously, powerfully make everything, yet deal with every obstacle. Very conservative, doesn't throw away thing, forgiving, loving, cleaning, strict, personal, friendly, communicative, didact didactive, teaching, leading, explaining, loving, forgiving, and caring. This is the nature of God. There are things in God that we cannot replicate, duplicate, because His holiness, His triune, and so on and so on. That part of God cannot transfer to human. But there are part of God that can transfer to us by His grace, such as love, fair, justice, forgiving, patience, and all of that, God, in his nature, allow us to follow that footstep. If we fail 2017, we have a chance 2018, if we live through this year. Regardless of time, you and I, whether we end today, our soul, our commitment live forever. We have the privilege to commit our soul to God's hand, whether we end today or end tomorrow or until he return. The choice is yours. Because by God's grace and kindness allow us to receive, to see, to hear everything. By our nature, we cannot do it. By God's grace, we can. I know it's complex, but that's what it is. As for you, as for us, we believe in the doctrine of grace. We believe that God kind to us and give us all of this. Let us, let us A, thank him. B, use it. Simple. A, thank God for the gift of grace. B, 
Let us use the gift of grace. Let us practice today. So now, let us remember the person who reconciled the whole world to himself by the blood of his cross. Remind us, do this in remembrance of him. I'm going to invite you to make, to make two lines, and we just come through and pick up the element and go back and receive together in conclusion. So please make up two lines. As we come up to the Lord's table, I would like you to do two things. One, examine our soul. Be real to ourselves. Know our destination. We say by God, we go to God. We not say by God, we go to hell. And just know it. Do not play game. Face it. I'm going to God by the grace of God, though I don't deserve. Or I'm going to hell because I deserve it. I don't care the grace of God. I'm fine going to hell. And that be true, be real. But let's be one or the other. However, you said, I, I don't deserve heaven if it meet neither, none of us. But if God allow us to receive the grace and by repenting, by apologizing, by asking God forgive, let's do it. So let us meditate on that. It's nice to have time and place and sit and meditate and pray long. It's good. But since we don't, let us be real in our walk of life, in a real walk too, to commit ourselves to God and ask for forgiveness daily. And then at the same time, rejoice. Rejoice the blessing that you and I have the privilege today. Not everybody have this. Only God chosen one. So chosen children of God, let us pray together. Dear Lord God, number one, we want to thank you for your grace to look upon lost soul, lost creation that we messed up all along. Now the final stage of your mission here, you save us by the blood, the blood of your sons on the cross. Now give us a chance to repent, to come to you, to grow by the power of the Holy Spirit in the church, which is your body. We thank you. We ask for forgiveness. And we also ask you to help us to not only grow from here, but to be your witness. Thank you, Lord God. And we give you the glory and thanks and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So please come to receive and to take communion with our God. Come. I do feel bad that we rush, that we have cramped time schedule and space and so on. But at the same time, in spite of cramped schedule, space, and finance, whatever we have, I do praise God that we still have this moment of communion. The time, the moment that we say we can say sorry to God, we renew our commitment, we renew, we actualize the blessing from God, he readily give it to us. But most important, as from here on, we can be his witness. We can live the life that proclaim, whether verbally or non-verbal action. So as we take this, we remember him. The blood 
the blood and the body of Christ broken to save us and to bless us in the Protestant Church and to send us out in a great commission. Let's live life 2018 as a life that we commit ourselves to remembrance of him in the communion. Let us take the bread. Likewise, the blood of Christ represented in the grape in the wine, and we use the grape juice to represent the wine, which is representing the blood of Christ. Remind us of two things. The broken bread reminds us the death of God, of Christ, to save us. The blood is the same thing. He shed his blood to save us from our sin. But at the same time, he said it's a new covenant, a promise, a celebration. The wine can mean celebration, promise, commitment that God made and swear and sworn and promised to us that we will be with him forever. We take this in remembrance of he died for us. At the same time to remember he promised to carry us through until the end. So let us celebrate in two aspects in this cup. Amen. I would like to invite Brother Ted to bless us in the last part of our service in benediction.